also the next of my talks, the third of my lectures, as, as you just heard, is on optical characterization. Uh, when Ramesh and I were discussing the possible topics for this course, this two-day course, we decided that you should hear not just about materials or devices, but also about characterization, because of course, it's really using characterization that we learn about our materials and our devices. So in this lecture, you're going to hear a few thoughts of mine about optical characterization, and in Ramesh's first lecture this afternoon, you'll hear about electrical characterization. Just a, an overview of each of those two topics. In, in an hour, I can't say too much about optical characterization, but nevertheless, I think it will be helpful for, for you. <clears throat> well, of course, as you know, it's a solar cell is an optical electronic device, and so we do need to understand the physical properties, really, of each of the components of the solar cell in detail in order to design better devices. And I mean by that that a thin film solar cell consists of perhaps six individual thin films to make the complete device. And we really need to know not just about the optical properties or the electrical properties of the individual pairs, but we also need to know about how they <coughs> interact with one another. And we really, if we're designing, if we're optimizing the, the optical properties of a device, we need to take all of these individual layers into account. And in this lecture, we're going to concentrate, as I said, on, on the characterization of the, the optical properties. So first of all, the basic tool of optical characterization is spectral photometry, measuring the reflectance and the transmittance of our materials as a function of wavelength. And we can learn a lot from these very simple measurements. We can derive, for example, the optical constants. Yesterday, you heard me talk about the refractive index and the extinction coefficient. These are properties that can be inferred by measuring the reflectance and the transmittance. There are commercial software packages available that enable us to do exactly that. We can also use the optical properties of the layers to help us design under reflection codings to ensure that as little as possible of the incident light is reflected from the surface of the cell, thereby is lost. We can make sure that as much of it as possible is transmitted into the cell. And you may have seen under reflection codings on, on cells. They have this deep blue appearance. And the reason is that they have been designed so that they reflect in the blue part of the spectrum, where there are very few incident solar spectrum and photons relative to the peak of the solar spectrum, which occurs in the central part of the spectrum, around about 0.5 per micron, 0.6 per micron in that region. We also can learn about the morphology of our thin films. In other words, if we make only a specular reflectance measurements from our films. That tells us a certain amount of information. But if we make a total reflectance measurement, we can find out about the light that is scattered at the surface. In other words, the light that doesn't follow Snell's law, angle of incidence, equal angle of reflection. When we get scattering, that law isn't obeyed. So we can actually find out something about the roughness of the surface of our films simply by measuring the specular and the total reflectance. We can also infer information about the density of our films, whether there are any pores or voids in the structure of the films. This is very useful for us to know. When, when we come to model the thin film optically, we tend to assume that it consists of a plain parallel slab of material and we do that so that we can fit into, we can analyze it using the laws of optics, Fresnel's equations, Maxwell's equations, and so on. But of course, in real life, a thin film isn't like that. 
it does have a roughness, it does contain points, and it really doesn't approximate very well to a plain parallel slab of material. Now we'll go on to talk about the characterization of devices. We talk about quantum efficiency, and we talk about current voltage characterization. And I'll show you some of the equipment that's used at NREL and the, the uh, conditions that are used in order to infer useful information. So first of all, spectrum photometry is a set for measuring the transmission and or the reflection from the film or a stack of films. And we do this across a range of wavelengths, usually with a UV visible spectrum photometer. We measure from a wavelength of something like 300 nanometers in the blue end to a wavelength of perhaps two and a half microns in the near infrared spark part of the spectrum. That covers the entire range of wavelengths and therefore energies of relevance to the operation of solar cells. And there are many manufacturers of spectrum atomics, of course, I'm sure you have them here. And by manipulating T of lambda and R of lambda, as I said, we can obtain the refractive index, the extinction coefficient. From the extinction coefficient, we get the absorption coefficient and from the absorption coefficient as a function of lambda, we can make an estimate of the band gap of our material. As I said, n of lambda, the fractal index extinction coefficient itself. <coughs> we really need what's called a double beam spectral automata in order to eliminate the effects of the substrate. Obviously, in a thin film system, we're trying to measure the optical properties of a film on a glass substrate. Well, the glass substrate has an, in, an influence on the measurements, and so we need to have a blank glass substrate in the reference beam of our spectrophotometer. And only by doing that can we obtain the properties, the reflectance and the transmittance of the film alone. We really want the film to be optically smooth in order to eliminate this diffuse reflection. If the film <coughs> isn't, then, as I said, we're going to get scattered diffuse reflection. We need the film to be free of pores, which it, will, it isn't always. We want it to have as near to the above density as the above material. Again, it doesn't always. And we want the film to be spatially homogeneous. That means in its depth, we want the material to have a constant composition in its depth. Thin films don't always behave like that. More importantly, perhaps, we want the film to be laterally homogeneous as well. When we use a spectrophotometer beam to probe the surface of a film, the properties of a film, the beam has a diameter of perhaps two or three millimeters, unless we take special proportions to the diameter of the beam. So we certainly want to ensure that the lateral properties of the film, the lateral composition of the film, is homogeneous to better than two or three millimeters. Otherwise, the way that will manifest itself is when we see interference fringes from our reflectance and transmit spectrum, we'll see that instead of being nice, sharp, clean peaks, they tend to wash out, they tend to be suppressed, and that's because of inhomogeneous effects. We can use an integrated sphere spectrophotometer to account for the diffuse reflectance. It takes into account all of the radiation reflected from the surface of the film, not just the specular radiation, but the, the uh, diffuse scattered radiation. So the components for the spectrum, the double beam spectrophotometer, we got a source of white light, usually a, a xenon a white light source, a monochromator to produce individual wavelengths, or any monochromatic light, holders for the test sample on the substrate, detectors, 
and a method of simple processing and outputting. This is just a, a schematic of a, a spectrophotometer. You have the source monochromator. Is a thick red line emerging from the monochromator, and it is reduced in thickness by this beam splitter here. This is a semi-silver mirror. Some of the light is transmitted, some of it is reflected to a lower semi-silver mirror, or again, some of it is directed towards the sample. Perhaps we're measuring a transmission, passes through the sample, then to the detector. The same happens with the reference substrate to its detector, and then electronics processes the two signals and takes the ratio of the two and gives us an output. Here's the URL to the, the um, part of Ponsberg's um, CD-ROM, uh, where you'll find uh, more information about this. When we have our values of T of lambda and R of lambda for our sample, we can actually obtain the, the optimal constants, provided that we know the film thickness. Well, most of you are familiar with film film techniques for, for measuring the film thickness. We don't need to stop on to dwell on that for too long. And we can use one of these software packages in order to obtain N and K of lambda. I use a package very, very commonly called TF Calc. It's manufactured or the software is written by a small company in the state of Oregon, in the northwest of the United States. Um, it's, it's quite expensive, but it's very, very good at being very fast. But there are many other commercial software packages that are available. From K, of course, we can find the absorption coefficient, alpha is 4 pi K over lambda. And from alpha, we can then make a plot for what I call direct band gap center. I don't know if you're familiar with that term or not, but when we excite an electron from the bound states of the valence band up to the conduction band, normally we hope that there isn't any additional momentum required. It's a direct band gap transition, so energy is increase as the electron is excited up to the conduction band. In an indirect semiconductor, like silicon, not only do we have to provide additional energy to excite the electron to the conduction band, but the conduction band is actually displaced in momentum space from the valence band. And so we have to add momentum as well. It requires the interaction with the third particle. And that's why the absorption coefficient of silica is much lower than the absorption coefficient of materials like cadmium telluride and CIGS. It's just less probable that we will absorb a photon and a phonon to provide just the right momentum and energy change. So if we have a direct band gap semiconductor, we can make a plot of absorption coefficient times H mu this is just the energy of the photon squared against the energy of the photon. And we can derive the band gap from that plot. Again, this is the values of N and K, the fractal index and extinction coefficient. This was for a TCO that I talked about yesterday. You can see that there was an intersection for N and K at this point. Now, at this stage, what Brunel's equations tell us, this defines what's known as the plasma frequency. This is the peak of the free carrier absorption band in the near infrared. This was for the TCO with a carrier concentration of 5 times 10 to 20. And so we get this peak absorption of 5 times 10 to 20. And this is very, very typical for a, a, a TCO with a carrier concentration in the 10 to the 20s. You can see that 
in most of the visible part of the spectrum, K is essentially zero. Now, the number of solar cell is operating in this part of the spectrum. So that's ideal. That's exactly what we want for a, for a TCO. We don't want it to absorb any light. Because as I showed you yesterday, when the light enters the cell, the first film that it sees is the TCO. So it's very good that we have a, a TCO like this, where K is zero, because that means alpha is zero. The absorption coefficient is also zero. And the, the, the message is that TCOs are transparent in the visible, but very reflective in the infrared. Notice that as we move further into the infrared, K increases very rapidly. And if we went a little bit further in wavelength along here, we would see that N also increases very rapidly. Now, Fresnel's equations tell us that the reflection coefficient is equal to uh, N squared, in essence, equal to N squared plus K squared. So it means that reflectance from a TCO at long wavelengths is unity. And these are the, the typical signatures of a good quality TCO. Complete transmission in the visible, an absorption band in the near infrared, and then strong reflection in the far infrared. And we can do all of that very readily. We can see all of that very readily with these simple spectral atomic measurements. Notice that the value of N in the visible part of the spectrum is about two, and that's very typical of what are known as free electron materials. The thickness that I used here was 500 nanometers of micron. This is the transmittance for a typical TCO, actually the absorbance as well. And you can see here that the transmission rises rapidly at this wavelength, something like 300 nanometers. Well, that tells us immediately that the band gap of this material is going to be somewhere near four electron volts. The rule is, if you take the cutoff wavelength in microns and divide that into 1.24, 1.24 divided by the cutoff wavelength in microns gives you the band gap in electron volts. Okay, that's a, a useful little bit of, it saves you some arithmetic when you come to estimate the band gap. So we rise very steeply as we move to longer wavelengths into the visible part of the spectrum, and then we start seeing the interference fringes, many, many interference fringes. And you can see in the, the red end of the, the, the infrared end of the spectrum, you can perhaps believe that the reflectance is, the transmission is just beginning to drop a little bit. And the absorption curve, here we come down from the fundamental band gap, complete transmission across most of this part of the visible, just a very few percent of the photons absorbed, and then along here, completely flat. If we went a little bit further, in the infrared, we would see this absorption rise very rapidly to a peak and then fall again. That's the free carrier absorption band. On the right hand side here, we have our alpha h nu plot. This is alpha h nu squared against energy h nu. And you can see that it's completely flat and that it rises steeply in this very straight line. And we extrapolate the straight line to the x-axis, and this value is the energy gap of the TCO. TCO in this case, but it could be any other semiconductor. This technique works equally well for all direct band gap semiconductors. As I said earlier, if we're dealing with an indirect band gap material, then we simply make a different plot. If we're dealing with uh, amorphous silicon, for example, it might work with a, a, an alpha h deep square. If we're dealing with crystalline silicon, which is indirect, the more the silicon becomes direct. Incidentally. Crystalline silicon is indirect. Then we need to make a plot of alpha h nu 
you walk out. Uh, so there's different techniques that are used depending on the nature of the semiconductor that, that we're working with. So again, the second figure shows just what I told you from my estimate, just from looking at the transmission curve, I said it looks as if it's cutting off at about 300 nanometers. So 1.24 divided by 0.3 is about 4. And indeed, the band gap comes out to be very near 4 micron volts. So to summarize all of that, very simple optical measurements can give very, very useful fundamental information. If we're doing research rather than manufacturing, this is just the kind of thing that, that we need. We've got to be somewhat cautious in interpreting the data, but I'm going to allow ourselves to be misled by artifacts uh, such as the inhomogeneities and in, in popular properties that I mentioned. And I wanted to discuss one technique, spectrophotometry. There are dozens of others, including ellipsometry. That's another very wonderful optical technique for characterizing the optical properties of materials. The modulated optical spectroscopies are also very useful. Things like photoreflectance and electroreflectance. These exploit what are known as second order optical effects. And they can also tell us a great deal about our materials. But in why I, I can't talk about this. So now we'll move on to talk about the, the uh, characterization of the actual devices. The quantum efficiency, first of all, it, it's defined as the, the number of electron volt pairs generated per unit time divided by the photon flux. It's a function of wavelength, of course, as you've seen from the various diagrams I've shown you. And we can obtain the light generated current from the quantum efficiency. If we represent the quantum efficiency as QE of lambda, then the light generated current, JG of lambda, is just equal to electron charge times the flux, the incident flux. Remember, this is the quantity that's measured in, in units of 10 to 17, that I showed you yesterday, multiplied by the QE. If we integrate that across all values of lambda, then we obtain the light generated current, and that should be, for a well designed cell, very close to the short circuit current density, which is what we actually measure. It doesn't necessarily equal JSC. For example, if we have a very badly designed collector grid in our solar cell, then JSC may be significantly less than JG. But for a well-designed grid and an ohmic path contact in our cell, then JSC and JG should be very close together. Again, N0 lambda is the flux measured in 70 to the minus 2 seconds to the minus 1. E is the electronic charge and QE the quantum efficiency. I think I've said most of this. The light generated curve can be obtained by integrating a vast expression across all wavelengths. And in fact, accurate measurement of the QE, as you mentioned yesterday, is completely central to measuring the current voltage characteristics and the efficiency of our solar cell. If we find that we integrate the quantum efficiency, across the full range of wavelengths between the cutoff in the near UV and the cutoff in the near IR, and we don't get the short circuit current that we measure, then there's something wrong with our measurements. Obviously, those two should be equal, and that's why knowing the quantum efficiency is vital for being able to make an accurate measurement of the current voltage current. So the third slide on QE, let's assume that we're dealing with a solar cell 
consistent with the n type emitter. We haven't used this term emitter very much. Some people say window layer. But if you think of a CIGS cell, for example, consisting of n type cadmium sulfide on p type CIGS, I would, in, in the old fashioned technology, the old fashioned terminology, sorry, I would call the p type CIGS the absorber or the base, the base by analogy with transistor technology, actually. And therefore, the n type CDS is what I would call the emitter, or in modern terminology, the window emitter. Now, in between these two regions, and I, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, there is this region called the space charge, and that's where the electrostatic field appears. Well, what happens when we bring together a p-type and an n-type material? Each of these materials has its own Fermi level. In the case of the n-type material, the Fermi level is near the convection band of the material. In the case of the p-type material, it's near the valence band. In the absence of any external contacts, when we bring those two materials together, thermodynamics requires that the Fermi levels are equal or horizontal across the junction. And the way that the system, the two materials do this, is that electrons are lost from the n-type side of the junction, holes are lost from the p-type side, and so the Fermi level on the n-type side drops, and the Fermi level on the p-type side rises. And that's what leads to the potential the field region in between the p and the n region. Electrons, I'm sorry, <coughs> electron hole pairs are typically generated by absorbed photons in that central region, in that space charge region, as well as in the base and in the emitter of our device. And that was the weakness that I pointed out to you yesterday in the, the analysis for the, the home injection cell. It was assumed in that mathematical analysis that no electron hole pairs are generated in regions where there's an electrical field. And clearly, that's not true. It can't possibly be that way. The absorption coefficient for long wavelength photons is much lower than that for short wavelength photons. And that means that the short wavelength photons are absorbed nearer the surface of our cell in the emitter. The longer wavelength photons are absorbed in the space charge or in the quasi-neutral region of the base. If we're dealing with a p-type base, then what we're interested in is the minority excess electrons. And they have to diffuse to the space charge region to avoid recombination in the quasi-neutral the same is true in reverse for the, the minority holes in the n-type emitter. I hope you can follow these arguments. So again, to repeat, short wavelengths, large absorption coefficients absorbed in the emitter. Some of the excess minority holes, if the emitter is actually active, what do I mean by that? Well, in many cases, particularly in thin film cells, it's believed the cadmium sulfide is not actually electrically active. It's of such poor quality that any minority holes that are generated there immediately recombine. Sometimes we call it the dead layer. But that can't possibly be true of the base, otherwise we wouldn't have a, a functioning device. So to be collected, if there are any minority holes generated in the emitter, then they have to diffuse to the space charge, as I've explained. This one was our expression that we showed yesterday. This is the 
lizard current. These would be short wavelength photons. This is the current generated at the base between these square parentheses and the multiplier here. We're using the symbol Ln, so we know we're talking about minority carriers, minority electrons, so it's a p-type base. And again, notice that there's no photons, no electron hole pairs being generated in the space charge region, which is completely false. It doesn't work that way. I'll, I'll show you why in a minute. I'll show you how we know that. In general, these variables are functions of temperature. So, for example, the minority carrier diffusion lengths are, are functions of temperature. The diffusion coefficient are also a function of temperature. D, incidentally, is the thickness of the emitter layer. The, the variables that may also be a function of voltage, that depends on the, the nature of the inflation. I showed you this at the end of uh, yesterday afternoon uh, from Osberg's um, CD. Um, this is the URL, and you can see what happens to the shape of the QV if you reduce the uh, increase, I'm sorry, the, the front surface recombination velocity, you'll see this gradually decreasing further and further. If you increase the minority carrier diffusion length, then you'll see this gradually increasing and squaring up. So, again, I urge you to take a look at that <coughs> site, that website, and play around with these variables, and just get a feel for their relative importance. So this for a, a two-sided uh, circuit, so, so it, when I say two-sided, by that I mean that the emitter actually is active. Long diffusion lengths in the base and the emitter, they ensure that we have a high QE, increasing the SRV, surface recombination velocity, reduces the blue quantum efficiency, increasing the SRV in the base, that is after that contact of our surface cell will reduce this. And I think I showed you that yesterday afternoon. So take a look, there's a lot to be learned from the quantum efficiency. This is a, a schematic of the system that's used at NRAL. Uh, it's it's what's called a grating quantum efficiency system and it measures the QE devices from 350 all the way up to 2.8 microns. Here's our xenon or tungsten source uh, for the chopper so that we can do phase sensitive measurements. Second order filters to remove the, the second order wavelengths. Um, and then a monochromator to produce the individual wavelengths. And so light is emerging from here, near monochromatic light is emerging from the monochromator this mirror and that one, and then onto the PV sample, there's a reference detector on this side as well. An X, Y, Z stage, change the spot size of the sample. This can be moved up or down. It can be moved laterally, that direction, or into the plane of the screen. And then we can show the, the output um, on a this information was provided to me by Keith Emery from NRAL in the measurements and characterization group, as were many of the subsequent slides in this particular talk. He gave a tutorial at the recent photovoltaic specialist conference in the uh, city of Austin, and uh, I'm sure if you would write to him, he would send you a copy of this book. measurement stage, as I've said, has to be very uh, delicately controlled. It sometimes is useful to 
change in temperature, as I mentioned yesterday, usually when we're looking at a PV array out in the field, its temperature will rise very significantly above the normal ambient temperature. And in a sense, that, that's what we want to happen because it ensures that we are absorbing the instant light. And so the, the, the array heats up. And if we want to simulate the quantum efficiency of a device that's actually operational in the field, then it's useful to be able to see what the individual cells behave like when we elevate their temperature, or indeed cool their temperature. In southern Colorado, for example, in the winter, we still have very, very bright sunny days, over 300 days of sunshine in, in Colorado. But in the winter, it's still cold. We get these beautiful, beautiful blue skies. And it's absolutely ideal for a photovoltaic array because we have intense solar radiation at reduced temperature. And a solar cell loves to operate under conditions like that. It means that the voltage increases. Why does the voltage increase? Because J0 drops. J0, remember, is a sensitive function of temperature. This is a, a photograph of the actual equipment in Keith Emery's laboratory, all of the, the individual components that I talked about. And as I've repeatedly said in the last few days, the quantum efficiency, to my way of thinking, is by far the most meaningful measurement that we can make on a, a cellular cell. Here we are looking at QE as a function of temperature, and you can see here 25 degrees moving all the way to now 70 degrees. And you can see that this, this long wave cutoff is gradually moving to longer and longer wavelengths. Notice that this was a measurement for the film photovoltaic device. About 10 or 15 years ago, my group at Emerald was very active in film photovoltaics. In other words, using infrared radiation instead of the sun's radiation. And for a thermal Film photovoltaic converter, we need semiconductors with a band gap of about 0.7 per electron volt. So that means that the wavelength equivalent curve is going to be somewhere in the 2 to 2.5 microns range. And you can see that the temperature coefficient is a strong function of the spectrum that we're using. And if we change the temperature, then we have to expect to see changes in the quantum efficiency. Another piece of work that I did with a colleague an embarrassing 25 years ago was looking at the bias dependence of our devices. And what we did was to reverse bias our cell cells. We were working on indium phosphide in cell cells. As we reverse bias the solar cell, we expand the space charge region between the P and the N type regions. So the N type region, I'm sorry, the space charge moves deeper and deeper into the P type absorber. That means more and more of the incident photons are absorbed in the space charge region where there is an electron electric field. That's really exactly what we want because it leads to the most efficient separation of the, the excess electron hole pairs. They don't have time to be combined as swept apart by the electric field. The reverse bias expanding the space charge further and further into the base also means that at longer wavelengths, we're getting more of those red photon generated electron hole pairs collected. So this is a really a research tool. Um, you have to be very cautious in interpreting the data, but we applied this, in this particular paper, we applied this technique to uh, Indian phosphide cells and to CIGS cells, and we were able to derive some very useful information. So what we're plotting here is the external quantum efficiency at some particular wavelength I can't remember what the wavelength is, but it really doesn't matter. And you can see, as we increase the reverse bias, we go further and further in reverse bias, the space charge is expanding 
further into the base, do the p-type indium phosphide base, or CIS base in this case, the quantum efficiency is rising. Qualitatively, exactly as we would expect. As we go far enough into reverse bias, we see that the plateau is reached. And I did a little bit of theoretical analysis to show that the value of this plateau region could lead us to uh, a useful approach for determining the minority carrier diffusion rate that was even able to determine the absorption coefficient. So by making this extra plot on the right hand side, nice straight line plot, I was able to derive the, the best estimate for the absorption coefficient. It was really a statistical technique, so that's the symbol that we use for the best estimate. And the best estimate of the minority carrier diffusion length, the minority electron diffusion length, was about 0.8 and 0.9 for the micron. Very useful. And finally, the measurement of the IV characteristics. This is the equivalent circuit of our device. We just have a, a diode operating in the dark in parallel with a constant current generator. And this is Remember, as I've said yesterday, this is always generating a light generated current. In this case, Keith Emery used the symbol J photo, JG is the symbol that I like to use. This in parallel, the shunt resistance, and in series, the series resistance. And here is the output voltage in this case. And these are the, this is the expression <coughs> that's used to uh, describe the we have the dark current, which consists of two components, and then one component, N remember, is the ideality factor. So N1 is the ideality factor relating to J01, the reverse saturation current density, for the diffusion mechanism, and N2 is the ideality factor relating to J02, which, which might be space charge recombination, shocking read all of data recombination, or even Auger recombination, as you heard Dr. Bryan talk about yesterday. So in general, when the measurements and characterization group looks at, uh, at the solar cell, they will assume that there are at least two mechanisms of recombination. This is the sort of characteristics that they get from measurements, current or power against the voltage. This is the power curve. I showed it in my diagram yesterday as a negative curve in the negative quadrant. Key memory has just reversed the polarity in this case. This is the maximum power point up here. So for this particular module, we can see the maximum power voltage. This is something like 20 volts. Maybe. This is the JV or IV, usually you use the symbol I to signify current. In other words, it's J times the area. This is the IFC point, and here is the VOC point. This is the dark current of the device measuring the array in the dark. And you can see as we go towards the origin, the device is beginning to break down. Not a very nice dark. This group, um, the measurements and characterization group, are equivalent to uh, the National Bureau of Standards for, for solar cells. And so they have to define their standards very, very carefully. If these people receive solar cells and even modules from researchers and manufacturers from all around the world. And there are two other groups like them, one at the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany and the other at the group in Japan. And they're the only three credit laboratories in the world where they are regarded as the primary standard for measurement of solar cell and module characteristics. They have the capabilities of uh, illuminating continuously a very accurately controlled temperature and total irradiance level. They use a, a, a standard ASTM G173 reference spectrum. This is the direct spectrum that's used to concentrate 
equivalent uh, spectrum that's used for what sun cells. There's an area definition and a host of other definitions that they use. So the area definition for efficiency measurements is the total area minus the peripheral bus bar areas. And there are several spectra that you take into account. The black curve here is what's called the M0 spectrum. If we are designing solar cells for operation in space on satellites, this is the spectrum that will be used, and we are no longer normalizing everything to a total radius of one kilowatt per square meter. It's about 1.4 kilowatts per square meter. This is the STM GM1, the STM G173. This is the global spectrum. This, so this is the, uh, the, the, the spectrum that's used when we include not just direct radiation, but also the radiation that's been scattered from clouds, from aerosols in the atmosphere, from particulates in the atmosphere. We don't really specify how the radiation reaches that horizontal surface, only that it does reach it. The blue curve here is the direct spectrum, and of course, it is somewhat less than the radiance from the global spectrum. So there are different spectra that are used dependent on how the, the solar cell or module is being used. This is a definition we've <coughs> seen several times. Efficiency is just equal to the ratio of the maximum power output divided by the total energy input multiplied by 100 to give it a percentage. These are the reference spectra that will be used, so choose your reference spectra carefully. And there may well be a difference between the test spectrum and the reference spectrum. And we introduce a term that Keith Emery discusses in his tutorial called the spectral mismatch factor. There's too much for me to go into that here. What do we want from our IV system characterization? Very low uncertainty because we are at MREL, the calibration laboratory, the voltage and current are measured to an accuracy of 0 0.02. This means an overall accuracy for the efficiency measurement of about 0.1. The system has to be extremely rapid. Remember, manufacturers want to be able to characterize their modules as they are emerging from the production line, and those modules are moving quite quickly. So we have to have a system that flashes electronically the characteristic is measured, and that module is known, its performance is known right away. The system has to be, the electronic system has to be very flexible so that we can operate in a wide range of different currents and voltages, and of course, need the lowest possible random error. And, and one of the reasons for that is that photovoltaic systems aren't always completely stable. Sometimes they drift. Their efficiencies typically will drift downwards over time. Well, if we want to know whether that drift, that deterioration is happening or not, then we need to be sure that it isn't just a random fluctuation in the electronics of our system. So the electronic system, the characterization system, has to be very stable. We want to be able to control bias and the light level. It's nice to be able to sweep the voltage when we measure the JV characteristic in both the positive going and the negative going directions. With some materials, there are time-dependent effects that are only revealed when you do these positive and negative sweeps. We need to be able to save to a database rather than to a directory. And most importantly, we need to have an automated method of naming the huge number of files that are created by the characterization laboratory. We also need to be able to examine and modify, if need be, the 
source code that was produced by the manufacturers of the IV systems. There's a number of manufacturers worldwide of these character, um, JV characterization systems. Because our needs, quite simply, they would change. Then there's a load of basic definitions that I mentioned before. The definition of the cell, the definition of a reference cell, uh, the definition of a submodule. Anything that consists of two or more connected cells is considered by NREL to be called a submodule. Um, a module is an environmentally protected device. Or what we mean by that is an array of individual cells, uh, uh, perhaps interconnected silicon cells in series and in parallel strings. They are typically mounted on a glass packing plate and then sandwiched with a glass packing plate on top with some sort of a resin to keep the layers together. So the cells themselves are environmentally protected. And that's what we mean by modern. Area definitions, cell total area, that is exactly what it means entire surface area that's illuminated, and that includes the grids and the contacts, the module or submodule aperture area, that's the total surface area excluding the frame of our module. <coughs> Usually there's a, a sort of a plastic frame that keeps the sheets of glass together in our submodule. And then the module area or submodule area, that, that's just the entire projected area of the module including the frame. And that's all I have to say on this topic. Let's occupy the hour. If anyone has any questions, I'll try to answer them.